All right, so open your Bibles, if you have them, to uh, Galatians chapter 5. This is one of the earliest epistles that Paul wrote, along with First and Second Thessalonians, which we discussed last week. And it kind of, it really shows, because when Paul writes to the Galatians, he's talking about an alternative gospel that they've received. Well, they had just been visited by Peter, and Peter told them that they needed to be circumcised if they were going to be saved, because Jesus Christ came to the Jews and died for the Jews. And if they're going to be saved, well, they need to be Jewish. And Paul wrote to them to say, now, who is it that came among you and confused you? Who preached to you a gospel other than the one you received? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, haven't you received the Holy Spirit? Haven't you already been saved? <laughs> Don't you know better? Well, Peter and Paul disagreed on this point, and it was a major point of contention for them. And Paul, well, he does not hide at all how he feels about Peter in this letter. And let me tell you, if you want to read, um, if you want to read a fight, this is a fight. Starting in verse 6, he says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision carries any weight. The only thing that matters is faith working through love. That's what calls us here. Not that we follow the law to the letter, but that we love one another. And that through love, we see the world. We reach out to everyone who is a neighbor, who is a brother and sister. If we do that, there is no law, as we're going to see. He says, you are running well. Who prevented you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. Notice he's talking about an apostle. One who's older than him. A little except no other view. But the one who is confusing you will pay the penalty, whoever that may be. Paul's a little sassy too sometimes. For you are called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only... Do not use your freedom as an opportunity to indulge your flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law can be summed up in a single commandment, namely, you must love your neighbor as yourself. Paul's telling us that we're free from the law, but does that mean that we're free to indulge in our sinful natures? Does that mean that we can do the things that the law restricts? Well, in some cases, yes. Because we Gentiles are not under the law that forbids us from eating certain types of meat. We never were. So in some cases, we can do things that aren't lawful for the Jewish community who are under that law. Paul, in this letter, also berates Peter for eating with Gentiles because he is a Jew. He can't eat what's unclean. He proclaims that they have to be circumcised. By his own admission, he is doing what's sinful by eating with them. Because if they have to be circumcised, then he has to eat clean foods. <laughs> you can't have one and not the other. But if, you can, but if you can do away with one, you can do away with the other. This is where we get that. Some say that Jesus proclaimed all foods clean. He didn't. But here Paul's doing it. He's saying we can't be hypocrites. In verse 19, he says, Now the works of the flesh are warned you before. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. There are no laws against those things, right? If we have those things, we're already obeying the law. And we're going further than what the law requires. Because if we have 
all of these attributes of the spirit, all these virtues, then we are going beyond. We, we are not committing any sins of the flesh. We are not committing any crimes of the world. Against such things, there is no law. In verse 24, now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also behave in accordance with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, being jealous of one another. In other words, the Galatians are jealous of those who are circumcised, who have that full law because they see them as closer to God. And Paul is saying they're not any closer to God than those of you who are living by the Spirit because in Christ there is no law. But this is Paul's view. And it by his very admission, conflicts with Peter's view. And that's kind of a problem, isn't it? Because do we follow Peter or do we follow Paul? When we read the Corinthian church, we see that there's exactly that division between those who follow Paul and those who follow, I believe it was Apollos, if memory serves me correctly. People would follow one apostle and not the other because they had an idea of whose word was best. Well, Fortunately for us, this argument was settled in the first century, and we have it here in Scripture in Luke's addition to his gospel, the book of Acts, in chapter 11. Peter finally comes around to Paul's way of thinking, but while Paul appeals to the Scripture in his epistles, that's a lot of alliteration, and You'll notice my sermon style is very much in line with that. I am appealing to the scripture just by quoting these to you. Peter has no such um, has no such inhibitions. He doesn't appeal to scripture at all. Instead, he receives a vision. And it says, Now the apostles and brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles too had accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers took issue with him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and shared a meal with them. How awful. Peter is acting just like a Gentile. But Peter began and explained it to them by pointing, um, <clears throat> explained it to them point by point, saying, I was in the city the, the city of Hopa praying and in a trance I saw a vision this was outlined in the previous chapter an object something like a large sheet descending being let down from heaven by its four corners of the earth notice these are four footed animals then I have not, Lord, for nothing defiled or ritually unclean has ever has ever entered my mouth. Ritually unclean. This mouth, the voice flies second time from heaven. What God has made clean, you must not consider ritually unclean. This not consider ritually unclean. This happened three times. And then everything was pulled up to heaven again. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea approached the house where we were staying. The Spirit told me to accompany them without hesitation. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He informed us how he had seen an angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Hopa and summon Simon who is called Peter, who will speak a message to you by which you and your entire household will be saved. Funny, the angel was already there. Couldn't he have just dropped the message off? <laughs> <laughs> the word angel means messenger after all. I guess this is the message. You, you will receive another letter. <laughs> I always hate those. Then as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as he 
did on us at the beginning. Remember at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descended on the whole church, which at that time was entirely Jewish. And I remembered the word of the Lord as he used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave them the same gift as he also gave us after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to hinder God? When they heard this, they ceased their objections and praised God saying, so then God has granted the repentance that leads to life even to the Gentiles. <laughs> Peter does not appeal once to the scripture. He has a vision. And the Gentiles have a vision. And because of that vision, the whole church believed. The whole church changed their beliefs. And I wonder if they're so willing, because it's Peter, if because it's a vision, or maybe because they've already received Paul's letter saying what an awful guy Peter is and how wrong, 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 wrong he is. <laughs> but I think it's all these things working together. We believe in the word because of the vision, we believe because of the miracles, and we believe because what it says is right and true. All of these things work together. And we believe because we're the church, we see it in our lives today. Not just, well, this is the right way to live, but because we do it. There are those who are quick to say that Peter doesn't require baptism. Because at, at after all, they received the Holy Spirit. But in the previous chapter, remember how I said all this came in the previous chapter? Well, in chapter 10, after they received the Spirit, Peter had said in verse 47, no one can withhold the water for these people to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? So he gave orders to have them baptized in the name of Jesus Christ then they asked him to stay for several days. Here is one of the strange instances where we see that people receive the Holy Spirit before they're baptized. It's kind of weird. It makes you wonder, do we receive the Spirit because we're baptized or do we become baptized because we've received the Spirit? And it's something to think about. I prefer to choose the latter. <laughs> <laughs> I think God yeah. works in mysterious yeah, ways. There's a pattern that we recognize as the Church of Christ, and here we see it back to front. And sometimes that's just how God works. I'd like to think that today we often see God working in our lives. We see God doing amazing things, carrying us through our trials and blessing us tremendously. And he works in ways that we might struggle to, to find that passage, but don't you know, he's right there. There's his angel. There's his word. There's his apostle. So brothers and sisters, when we leave here today, I want to invite you to look at those angels, to look for those apostles. And if you're struggling to find them, to find them in the word and to find them in one another. Because don't you know, we are all God's angels. So with that, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for bringing us together, for reminding us that we were once all unclean, but that you have called us, that you have sanctified us, that you have saved us through your Son, and that through us, you are making a better way. You are making a church. You are making a way in which everyone can be saved, not from the fires of hell, but for your way of living, for your life, for your family, for your church. 
and four, to give brothers and sisters to your one and only Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that in us the world sees you, that in us the world sees blessing and hope and kindness 